Hi, I'm Heidi Harriet, the host of the Animal Tales podcast, and I'm thrilled to be bringing you our second episode of Animal Tales Presents Dog on Good Information. I am pleased to be joined by my co-host, Tommy Fahey. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Heidi. How are you today? I'm good. I'm actually really excited. Our first episode is out and on the ground and got some good attention. So that was yeah, a lot that's of fun. awesome. Yeah. Very and, exciting. Yeah. And, you know, our discussion last week was a lot of fun. And again, this would be something I would be calling you this morning, probably if we weren't doing a podcast to catch up on some of the things, some crazy things, some neat things, some interesting things that I've come across this week. So we're just going to do that on the air. Okay. We've changed our phone calls into Zoom meetings. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Verizon will not be happy, probably. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I want to hear about your week too. I, I'm during the week like you, I'm training and right now I'm training some horses and a, uh, couple dogs as well as the dog that I recently adopted. I was fostering. I think they call that foster failure when you, <laughs> when you <laughs> adopt the foster dog. Uh, but in, in fairness, I knew I was looking for a standard poodle and, a foster came in, I, I took on a foster and he ended up being the right dog for me. So I was in the, you know, in the market, if you will, for a dog. Um, yeah. But interesting, something on that front and not really throwing anybody under the bus here, but you know, when we, it's very emotional getting pets and you and I have talked about this and the commercials on TV and messages everywhere you go, adopt, don't shop and get a pet and, you know, help the pet population. So, you know, and I'm a professional animal trainer. I've owned all kinds of animals in my life, and I know exactly what I'm getting into. But interestingly, this dog um, was rescued from a, a bad situation. I won't go into that. But they went to the vet and got his whole work up, and they, all these dogs that came had worms. And this was a few months ago. And so they took care of that. As you know uh, from the vet practice, that can reoccur. Oh yeah, uh, but he—it's actually hookworms, so it's okay. kind, of, kind of a big deal, right? Yep. Yeah. Need to take care of that. So I—I I had him to my vet because my little dog Trooper was going to the vet. So I let—I let the big guy accompany him, and he ended up getting his fecal sample and such, and so he's on medicine. But the interesting thing about that. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, but the interesting thing about that is if I had kids who played in the yard or had a lot of other dogs or such, I understand that these larvae can go into the soil, which yep. is how some of these, these hoarders or these places that take on way too many dogs or feral cats have, have problems like that, right? It becomes, it, it just, you can't get on top of it. Is that correct? Yeah, you, you get a population growing and then uh, it reinfests the, uh, the animals that are in that environment. Yeah. So the reason I'm bringing that up is because I think last week we touched on responsible pet ownership, right? Yes. And not even to mention the cost of, you know, getting this dog and getting to the vet. Now we're on worm medicine. We're going to go back and get another fecal and more worm medicine. And I'm very happy to say that my vet is still a private practice, uh, Dr. Canavan. She's wonderful. And she wasn't bought out by the private equity that we were talking about last week as well. So I got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with her and we'll get this sorted out. But again, there's a cost involved here. There's a uh, consequence. Now, what if I didn't know what I was doing and I was so excited to have this new dog and I took him to the dog park, I took him to the farmer's market, I let him have play dates. This is something that really needs to be quarantined from what I understand. Yeah, it happens all the time that we are not prepared to go out into the public, uh, whether it be from a training perspective or from a health perspective. Yeah. Um, we're just excited to have that new individual in our lives and get out and Show you know, them start off and have fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think of it like uh, having a newborn baby. You're not going to take that newborn out into large public spaces. You're not going to go into big crowds. You're not going to go uh, to a concert or something of that nature. You know, for the first few months, you're going to gradually start to introduce the baby to, to 
larger and larger environments. Um, but yeah. we forget that when it comes to our pets, we kind of go all in and, and just go for it um, without thinking of the things in those terms. Yeah. And for those so, who didn't yeah. listen to our last episode, what a shame, but you still can because it's online and uh, there's video and audio. So it's a podcast and it's also on YouTube and our Facebook channel, Heidi Harriet's Animal Tales. All that is in show notes, all the links. But Tommy's uh, training tip last last week, uh, actually that came out this past Tuesday, but it'll be online for you to take a look at, was to when you get a new pet or even not even a, just a puppy, but you know, a new pet into your world to not overly socialize it, to not go crazy. So if you haven't seen that episode, take a look, because that was really uh, very good information. And we were talking about that a bit in reference to this canine flu influenza that's mm -hmm. around the country. And it, you can feel free to look that up, this uh, canine illness that I, I believe has a lot to do with sharing water bowls at the parks, farmers markets, uh, restaurants. People want to be kind and put a water bowl down and that's saliva and all that. Tommy went on to talk about best practices in that and we'll always touch on that a bit. Um, and Tommy, after our episode, I'm always curious about these things. Again, for those who are just joining in with us, I'm a generational animal trainer, a third generation animal trainer. And I came to this world watching experts, my dad and others. And I was too young. My grandfather died um, when I was still very little, but was told he was just amazing. But uh, so I came into it uh, understanding training, but not really being able to articulate it. My dad was, uh, a, I always say he was a Dr. Doolittle, right? He could truly talk and communicate with animals, but some of that was on a silent, you know, telepathy type thing. And Tommy, uh, tell us how you come to this with your background in schooling. Yeah, so I started uh, as a kid. I, I loved animals. I was super interested in them, but my family wasn't really into the animal world. Um, but I had a dog when I was about eight years old. It started there uh, and had several other things uh, along the way, a hamster and a snake and a few other things. Um, and then I got into horses um, and, and horses is really where it took off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've gotten to do a lot of things with horses. Uh, entertainment is probably one of the largest things that I've done. So I've worked for all the big uh, dinner shows, the yeah. Dixie Stampede, the Arabian Nights. Um, I also worked for the Kentucky Horse Park in Lexington. Which is where uh, we met. Yeah. Yes. That's how we actually came to be. Um, although I knew about you for quite a long time before that. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I can tell the story if we have time. Sure. Um, I was, uh, the, the first time I knew about you, I was working in Pigeon Forge uh, at the Dixie Stampede in Tennessee there, and you were on the Ringling Brothers show that oh, had come okay. to Knoxville. Yeah. And so a big group of us went to go see the show in Knoxville, and there you were with your daughter, Cassidy, um, and of yeah. course stood out with the beautiful white horse, Lady Dancer. Yeah, and my minis. And, and Lucky minis, Star. Yep. <laughs> Lucky Star, the one and only. Lucky Star goes to Ringling Brothers. Exactly. So yeah, we uh, I, I knew about you then from, from that. Oh, okay. Um, and then it was years later when I was at the horse park that we actually ended up working together. Yeah, I got to do some training up there and it was that was just fun. And our, our mutual friend, Kelly Mardell, who was the entertainment manager there and you were her assistant and you guys were yep. training horses. It, it, what a great place to visit if you're a horse person. So yeah. Yeah, it's and amazing. Then, but you also took it from there and got schooling and wanted to be a vet and really delved into the depth of this, which is cool. Yeah, so I spent uh, a, a lot of years working in shows, working in uh, training and doing this stuff. And um, what I thought was, I really need a, a degree behind this. I want to know, I've always been the kind of person that always asks why. Yes, or you how. are. <laughs> I want to know how it works. Yeah. I want to know why we're doing it. God bless your um, mother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> poor thing. Um, so when I see an animal perform a certain behavior in a, show, a particular show or, or whatever it's doing, I want to know how did you get there? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to kind of take that apart. And so I was working for a vet clinic. I spent about four years working as a, a veterinary, veterinary technician. 
Um, and I thought, I like this medicine thing. I'm going to go on to school. And uh, so I, I went ahead and uh, got back into school here at Missouri State University in Springfield. And it has a program that goes towards the vet, veterinary school at MU, Missouri uh, right. University in Columbia. So I went ahead and got enrolled and finished uh, in a, to finish my bachelor's degree in animal science. Uh, and then as I started researching how much veterinary school costs <laughs> uh, and then how much your average salary coming out uh, is going to be, it really just didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Uh, so your average debt coming out of veterinary school is two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And then your average starting salary is around 50,000. Wow. Now, of course, that's going to vary depending on your, your sure. scholarships and then what location you're in. And there's lots of programs to help with that. Yeah. But I looked at those numbers and I went, e I could just train animals. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, finished my degree in animal science and equine science. Um, and my interest with that is uh, really the behavior yeah. and the psychology behind it. I'm so um, glad you went to school because I didn't have to go to school. I just called you and said, what about this, Tommy? What about yeah, that? What about this? Exactly. Behavior? What about this terminology? So it was actually worked out really well for me. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <It was laughs> Your awesome. bill is in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you're just joining in, I'm Heidi Harriet, and I'm joined by Tommy Fahey. Some doggone good information. We're just delving into... Uh, pets and training and the way people think about it. And one of the things we talked about in our last uh, episode was um, it was the pet peeve of the last episode where I talked about trainers who say we train with positive reinforcement. And um, I just don't believe they're, they're training solely with positive reinforcement. And I don't, have an issue with the fact that there are training programs that incorporate um, a lot of uh, different aspects and the training program that includes opera, uh, positive reinforcement training uh, method theory is operant conditioning. So we kind of left you hanging with that last week and we're going to take a real deep dive into that. I want to go back for a minute, Tommy, and talk about last week we were talking about responsible pet ownership. So after the episode during the week, I was Googling around and I, I Googled responsible pet ownership. I thought, well, I'll just start there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turns out the CDC has a pretty good amount of information and I think level-headed what you and I would agree with information about responsible pet ownership. So I would encourage folks to take a look at that. And it talks about kind of best practices and keeping your pet safe and um, uh, diseases or things that can transmit zoonotic diseases. Thank you. Yep. The, the school zoonotic, person. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> I would just say, you know, those things that translate to other animals, but. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. I, I really appreciated that. And um we're going to we're going to hammer away at that cuz i think you and i are both passionate about that we believe that best practices are what are getting kind of left behind in the kind of frenzy of pet owners especially dog owners is the primary topic here and we also both have uh, great horse expertise and horse trainers so i don't know if you want to touch on that for a minute and then we'll move into our main topic yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that and kind of uh, real world stories from this week. Yeah, um, hashtag so as far real, as, world, real world stories, real life problems. Yeah, hashtag best practices. <laughs> um, so Ooh, Write that down. <laughs> there you go. So I, my job is as a, mostly as a horse trainer and I travel around farm to farm uh, to work with different horses at people's different facilities. Mm -hmm. And I was at a, a facility yesterday and uh, the owner wasn't available, so I was just there on my own. I went out to catch the horse I was going to work with, and immediately I see she's got uh, drainage from her sinuses, so she's got a snotty nose. Um, and we just had some warm weather here in Missouri, so I thought, well, maybe it's just allergies. Uh, you know, things are starting to bloom. Maybe she's a having a little problem with that way. But as I got closer, I could hear her cough. 
Oh. So she coughed a few times. And then as I got closer, I could see that the, the sinus drainage was colored, uh, had a green tinge to it. And I said, Oh, this horse is sick. We don't work today. Yeah. Um, so I said, okay, we skip her. I didn't get close to her. I moved on to the next horse. Turns out that horse had the same thing going on their uh, side by side uh, share a fence line on the sure. pasture. So I said, okay, they've got an upper respiratory, something going on. I'm not a vet. I can't diagnose it. I can't recommend treatment. Um, but as far as best practices go, I said, no training today. I am going to go and wash my hands and clean my equipment before I go to the next farm. Um, I had a jacket on, so I took the jacket off. I turned it inside out. I balled it up. It goes in the back of my truck. I wash it for the next time. Um, so that I don't carry whatever that disease mm -hmm. might be. And it, it could be nothing. I mean, it could be just a minor respiratory infection or it could be something more serious. Would it, is that um, what, isn't that a little what strangles looks like in the early stages? It can be. Yeah. Yeah, it can be. <clears throat> Which um, for horses is a really nasty, uh, co communicable, yeah, it's a, transmittable, uh, it's a strep infection. Um, so very, very similar to strep throat in humans. Horse people don't even want to hear that word. <laughs> no, it's a very bad word. Um, so yeah, I don't know what it is. Right. Um, but so I, as for my particular situation, clean all my equipment, uh, make sure right. I am clean. So I don't carry that on to the next place, next place and yeah. then immediately communicate with the owner and say, Hey, you've got this going on. You need to contact your veterinarian and get recommended treatment. Uh, so that's yeah. something to consider. A yeah. lot of people don't even look at those little signs. Um, and if you're out in a public setting, dog comes into the, to the a grocery situation. store, yeah. <laughs> low is a target. We talked about that last week. Um, uh, people don't even look at that. They're not even aware of looking for these symptoms. Your uh, best so sound bite from last week. And I want to put this on our social media, um, pull it out is you said, if they didn't ask you for a vaccine uh, card or information, they didn't ask anybody else. Exactly. I, thought, I, I actually had a couple people uh, that listened. We had a few people listen to the podcast. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. So of those few people, a few reached out to me and, and were really um, interested in that, that like, wow, I never thought of that. And I've never thought about it in those terms, but I'm not somebody who wants to take my dog everywhere. I enjoy them at home. I train them. I actually have performed with dogs in the past, but I, I'm just not a person who does that. And I really yeah. want us to think about that as we, I want to keep exploring that because I do appreciate, I have friends who do that and I, I kind of am starting to understand it. I never used to, but I still want to keep uh, unpacking that because I think that best practices and, and these canine flu that is kind of sweeping the country. We had it here in my County and they actually closed the shelter and didn't adopt any dogs, didn't let any in, any out. And right. I'm, I no doubt they made their best efforts to, you know, uh, sterilize their environment because mm -hmm. a lot of them are going home to pets, you know? So, uh, um, yeah, exactly. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to, I want to get into our, our main topic today. But real quick, I want to tell you something that good that happened to me this week. I am so proud to have become an American Kennel Club, AKC, Canine Good Citizen Evaluator. So I'm Congratulations. really... Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I'm really psyched about that. And the AKC Canine Good Citizen Program is something we will talk about on this podcast a lot. It'll actually come up in our next sec segment about training. Um, it's a foundation training program but it kind of makes it fun and it gives people the opportunity to actually get like evaluated, get a certification, which is a lot of fun, but I'm doing it with my new dog, Otis. And, um, I, I'm, we're going right into it. I've had him a few weeks, but it's just a great program that includes uh, 10 behaviors, including walking on a leash, sit, stay, going off with others, not jumping on others as they come to you. And it's a, a lot of it is, with the thought in mind, housing developments, condominiums, that HOAs, that kind yeah. of thing, uh, to make sure the dogs coming in are safe. So sure. we're happy to have your dog. We're not going to be breed specific or anything, but it has to have a CGC, canine mm -hmm. good citizen, eval uh, uh, 
certification. And so I love that. And I've loved the program so much. And as a trainer, I wanted to become an evaluator. So, and there's also something called the star puppy uh, certification and oh, I that's love cute. puppies. So I can't wait. I'm excited. So yeah, Excellent. I'm going to do a little bit more with that. So I want to segue now. I'm going to hand it over to Tommy because we're going to talk about something he and I have talked about so much um, on the, our phone calls and um, it's called operant conditioning. And this goes back to seeing so many trainers and, and people say they train with positive reinforcement. And I personally, as a third generation trainer, watching my parents, other experts that they, their peers and my sisters and I are all trainers. I think that there's more to it. I think positive reinforcement and the positive aspects of training are the important uh, part, and we highlight those, but that is not their all, all there is to it. So, Tommy, I'm going to let you segue us into this training uh, theory. Uh, B.F. Skinner came up with a training theory called operant conditioning. Take yeah, care. so uh, we hear a lot about positive reinforcement, as Heidi said, um, and I think... So something I think you'll hear us talk a lot about is definitions, defining what is the real definition, not the connotation, but the denotation connotation being uh, what is thought of, but denotation being what's actually written down in the dictionary. There's that degree um, I, at work. I know big <laughs> words. So I'm really big on that. Uh, as I teach people to train, as I uh, help people understand behavior, uh, you need to understand the definitions without the emotion behind it. Yes. So first, let me say there's nothing wrong with positive reinforcement, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. Yeah. What is wrong is advertising that you only use positive reinforcement without actually understanding what positive reinforcement truly means or miseducating your public uh about what these definitions mean. So I'll step off my soapbox and then start on to, so operant conditioning falls in, has four quadrants. So you have positive reinforcement, which we've talked about. You have negative reinforcement. Then you have positive punishment or negative punishment. So those are the four quadrants that you fall in. So the first thing to do is think, think of a number line just a very simple number line, zero in the center. Your positive numbers go one to 10 out to the right and your negative numbers zero to 10 to the left. And We've they'll all be seen seeing that. this on the screen. Yes, there'll be a graphic. Describing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so right to left, right is positive, left is negative. All positive means is that we have added. All negative means is that we have taken away, we have subtracted. So what gets confused there is positive meaning good and negative meaning bad. Right. And it has nothing to do with good or bad. That, okay. That's huge. Just that. Let's just take a breath there and take that in because that's really huge. And again, I didn't it, grow up with the terminology. I grew up with uh, the implementation of these things. Exactly. I've had to back up and learn the words because I am an animal trainer and I don't only trained for performances. I want to help people train foundations on horses and dogs or my wheelhouse. So, I mean, that, I knew that, but hearing you say that, this is something we've conversed about, that positive um, means you add, negative means you take away. And when you start to think of it in those terms, and we are so emotional about animals and this particular subject of training. So I just wanted to take a moment and let, let kind of let that soak in for folks because it's, Taken me a while to let it soak in. Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions yeah. when you're talking about animal training and specifically operant conditioning. I think it's the biggest misconception is the positive versus negative and the definitions we use to describe them. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so a, can a big, you, okay, big so we have positive reinforcement. Give us an example okay. of that. So well, let me back up real quick. Okay. So that was the left to right, positive and negative. Oh yeah, we're still in the now. Yeah, now you have up and down. Okay. Okay. So at uh, going upwards, you have reinforcement, and then going downward, you have extinguishment. 
Okay. So are we reinforcing the behavior? Or do we want the behavior to happen again and become more likely? Or do we want the behavior to become less likely, happen less often, and eventually be extinguished, not happen again? Okay. So what's commonly misunderstood there, and it's, uh, I think, often uh, a big problem, is are we rewarding or are we punishing and we hear punishment and we think, oh, that's terrible. That's really bad. And we hear reward and we think, oh, that's got to be really good. It must mean food and treats yeah. and happiness. But that's not necessarily the definition of this particular scenario. Here's what I see when I hear you say that. The, I go to a client because their dog is barking incessantly and they can't stop it. I come in the door, they're holding the dog and it's barking incessantly and they're petting it. Uh-huh. That's, yeah. that's where my mind goes when you're talking about that. We're rewarding that behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's go and put an example. Now, you understand the left and right, positive and negative. We understand the up and down reinforcement or extinguishment. So now let's look at some examples in those four quadrants. Yeah. So we'll start with the positive reinforcement. And I think that's what most people um, want to trend towards. And I think that's not a bad thing. Sure. Um, so the, just a very basic idea of positive reinforcement is a dog sits, the dog gets a treat, and then that behavior becomes more likely. So the sitting becomes reinforced. So in that scenario, your stimulus is the food that you're holding. I would like behavior, to add to that because I'm not a treat yeah. trainer that the reward from me would be good boy, good girl, not have a yeah. party, good girl, and like get them out of their sit. But exactly. if you don't have a party, I kind of keep it, like keep the energy towards the down of the sit and I'll pet them. I'll like kind of heavily just stroke their head. I don't get it. Eh. You know, yeah. don't have a party, so but I'm not a treat trainer. So yeah. it becomes positive because yeah. you're adding. Yes. Yeah. So by petting, or a verbal good boy, you're adding. So that's where we're going positive. Yes. Okay. And then the reinforcement is that it's something the dog enjoys or the dog has learned to enjoy because you've paired it with something the dog enjoys. Okay. Now that's going into a, a totally different topic, which is class, classical conditioning. Right. Um, and we'll get to that later. Yeah. Don't get your. That's confused. another podcast. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> In this simple scenario of the dog sitting, the stimulus for this example is a food reward. The behavior is the dog sitting. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to go to the upper left quadrant, which is negative reinforcement. Okay. And I think this one happens quite often and we don't even realize it. Um, so the dog barks at the mailman that is delivering the mail. The mailman leaves, not because the dog barked, but because it's They've got to go on and do their rest of their mail route. But the barking has become reinforced because the stimulus has been taken away. So the stimulus in this scenario is the mailman. The behavior is the dog barking. Yeah. And so in the dog's brain, he has chased the mailman away. <laughs> and so every time, and this happens, and I use this example because it's happened with my dog, Jimmy Dean, yeah. the Jack Russell Terrier. You'll hear a lot about him. Oh, Jimmy Dean. Yeah. Uh, I have my mailboxes right up on my house and the mailman comes right in front of the front window. Jimmy Dean sees him, gets excited, barks at him, and then the mailman walks away. And that has then reinforced the behavior of him barking at the mailman. Gotcha. Though we call it negative reinforcement, there's nothing bad in that scenario. Right. Just remember that. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to move to the bottom section of operant conditioning, and that's where we're going into extinguishment. Okay. So uh, positive punishment. We are adding a punishment, adding a stimulus that is going to extinguish a behavior. So an example is a dog lunges while it's on a leash. You're leading the dog, you're walking the dog down the sidewalk and the dog lunges. If you have a choke chain, the choke chain engages. So it restricts around the dog's neck. When the dog comes off of the pressure of that, it releases. And so you have added the stimulus of the engagement of the choke chain. That is going to make the behavior, which is the dog lunging, become less likely. 
Okay, so we have added positive, a noxious stimulant, something that the dog will not like, which is the ch- choke chain engaging. Yeah. And so the dog pairs the two and decides he doesn't want to lunge anymore. Okay. Now we're going to go to our last segment, which is negative punishment, which sounds terrible. Negative and punishment in the same section. It sounds just awful. Yeah. No trainer wants to stand up there and say, I trained with negative punishment, right? So yeah, that's part of what's going on here. We're trying to stay warm and fuzzy, you know? Exactly. So in this scenario, I'm going to say the dog jumps on a person that's walked into the room. Okay. And we've all seen this. Um, one way to curb that behavior, the dog jumping is for the person to ignore the dog, to just turn away, not put any focus on the dog. So you're, you're removing what the dog wants is interaction. Okay. That's what the behavior is signifying. You're removing that interaction. And so that is going to extinguish the behavior of the dog jumping. So in that case, you have the stimulus, which is the person and their attention. Okay. The behavior is the dog jumping. When the person removes their interaction with the dog, the dog is less likely to jump. In theory. <laughs> in theory. It doesn't always work. Yeah, it hasn't worked for a lot of my clients, but. <laughs> yeah. Now I have a, a real life I, example I, of yeah. this. No, I go ahead. Yeah. So exactly negative punishment. So I go to a farm that has a probably 110 pound silver lab. Oh yeah. His name is ammo and he is <laughs> ammo. great. He's a wonderful dog. He's yeah. super sweet. Very, very social as most labs are. Yeah. Okay. So the family has sort of reinforced him jumping oh, on boy. new people because they allow him to jump on them. Right. And every time he jumps up, he gets a pet and he gets excitement and all of that. So when I started going to this farm, he immediately came up to me and jumped up on me and his paws go all the way up to my shoulders. Yeah. So my initial thought was I'm going to step into him and push him out of my space. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm adding, which would be a positive punishment. Right. But he took that as more interaction and he liked it. It was playful for him. (laughs) I said, okay, this didn't work. So instead, the next time he jumped up on me, I just turned away and ignored him. Right. And he kind of looked at me. He did the the head tilt. He's like, why aren't you playing with me? What happened here? Yeah. And after two or three times of that, now he does not jump on me at all. It only took about two or three times. And now I've added to that that I don't interact with him until he comes up and politely sits. And I didn't make him do it. I just waited for him to offer the behavior. And then I rewarded the sitting behavior yeah. by interacting with him. Right. So oh, interesting. I, yeah. I took sort of a diagonal line. I went yeah. from the lower left negative punishment and I took it to okay. the upper right, right positive reinforcement. Right. Um, but that took a few sessions. Sure. Right. Yeah. And there was nothing bad or untoward about that scenario. Well, the other thing I'm certain that you did, and this is where, as you know, with our clients with horses and and mine with dogs, it's their confusion of their body language and their verbal cues and their um, energy and uh, physical cues that confuse the animal. You and yes. I do know how to be very clear when we do that. Our turn away is very intentional and very understood. And because I do the same thing with clients, but they they get they're kind of in the middle and it's, you know, all uh, convoluted and it confuses the animals. And so along with operant conditioning, we need to make sure that we're just body language and energy and physical and verbal cues are very very concise and intentional. And, you know, I even had a lady call me this morning when I was getting ready to come here and we're texting about, well, she called me and then we started texting about dog training and uh, with her dogs. And she said, I'm the one who needs a training. (laughs) I have a friend who says operator, operator error. (laughs) Absolutely. I have a girl I train with horses and she always goes operator error. And at first I didn't know what she meant. And then I, I always laugh about that. So 
you know, there is that. I actually have in my thing dog and their people training because the people have to figure it out because you and I can go in and often we can change that behavior pretty quickly just by putting our shoulders back and, you know, hey, you know, giving them a, uh, you know, or. Yeah, it's how you carry yourself, the energy you give out. I always tell people, don't round your shoulders, don't bend over and stick your hind end out. The energy leaves there. (laughs) Yeah. It kind of goes out that end. I think a lot of that is coming from our sort of modern society and technology. And we don't, human to human, we don't have as, uh, as extensive uh, body language observation. Yeah. Um, we found this actually with the, the pandemic and people wearing masks Oh yeah. that young people were not understanding facial recognition, facial cues. Yeah. Um, so that become becomes a really big problem Yes, that we are unaware of our own body language. Yes. We're unaware of ourselves in a lot of scenarios. And animals, they're so pure about that, especially if we haven't gotten in their way, if you don't have one who's neurotic from people they've been around or something. But I always say they're pure. They don't overthink it. They're just looking for direction exactly. and leadership. And it needs to be you know, calm and it needs to be very clear and concise. So we are going to have to pick this up on another episode, but I think you've given a lot of information and some great examples to think about. I, I was, I wrote this down this week because I think about this a lot, all this positive reinforcement. I'll look at trainers pages. Sometimes I'm gauging what they charge for something. And now more often I'm looking at why they say they train with positive reinforcement. And I always think it's, are we, are we as the clientele, are the clientele demanding and asking for that? Like, I want you to train with positive reinforcement. So now the trainer says, okay, I train with positive reinforcement. You know what I mean? Are we, maybe if you're listening to this podcast and you're a dog owner and you're, you're an animal owner and you're looking for training, is that what you're kind of demanding of your trainers? And if so, I hope that this information is helping you understand that if they are doing that at times and you know I, I appreciate people who are trying to make a living as trainers but are they just pandering to what is being asked for instead of being true to the fact that I need to explain this to you because it's actually not what you think or it's there's more to it I don't know yeah. if you if you feel that that's the case well, I think it, it all boils down to people not understanding, like what I talked about earlier, just the, the basic definitions. Yeah, I think that's true. And we have uh, developed some incredible marketing strategies yes. that use um, words that have different meanings. Oh, yeah. So just like positive versus negative, um, we, have, we use particular words because of their connotations. Yes. Um, so when you go and meet with a marketing person, they might reword what you're saying to make it sound with a little different spin. Absolutely. And the, the, the masters at that are one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast and the Animal Tales podcast. We're getting our information from the animal rights extremist groups, PETA, the Humane Society of the United States, ASPCA, In Defense of Animals. They're, the list goes on. And these are what most people would consider mainstream I consider them not to have any credibility. They are not, let me repeat, not animal experts. They are experts in creating a narrative, spinning a story, marketing, and marketing, frankly. And Mm -hmm. we're basing a lot of information on that. And thank you for that, because that's leading us into a future episode about shelters. There's so much information about shelters out there and rescues and such. And again, led by this multi-million dollar fundraising campaigns. There's so much more to that story you need to know. I always say it's a happy face emoji or the care emoji and the sad or the angry face. But hmm, this is the face I want. Be curious, be thoughtful. There might be more to that story. Well, there is, and we're going to bring it to you. We just got to stay tuned so you can stay with us as we move through all this. There's a lot of information. So Tommy, yeah. I want to, we'll, we'll revisit this for sure, because I think this is something that needs some time to settle in it. I know it has for me and I actually do it, but I needed to understand the terminology. 
Yeah, it's a big topic and there's a lot more to unpack, but that was a good overview yeah, of was. the basics of operant conditioning. And thank you for the lovely graph. <laughs> uh, so we're going to move on to a segment we call pet peeves pet and, uh, peeves tommy i'm gonna let you take the pet peeve this week so my pet peeve this week is a big word called anthropomorphizing oh boy yeah. <laughs> i knew you'd like that good one yes yes so anthropomorphizing is putting human thoughts emotions onto non-human beings yep Um, Now, I might not go the direction with this that you think I'm going to completely go in. I think it's a common problem across the board. A lot of other topics are, have the same issue is that we live in the extremes. Yeah. We are either at a 10 or a zero when we should be at a five. Right. Happy face, sad face. Exactly. So I think what we have with anthropomorphizing is we have people at a 10 who think of their dog as their baby. Yeah. And one of my one of the things that gets really under my skin is when people say you're the mommy or you're the daddy. Uh, that just irritates me. Yeah. Um, I have my dog, Jimmy Dean, the Jack Russell. I am not his dad. I am his owner and his leader. And I try to carry myself that way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So big pet peeve for me is that. But on the other extreme from that, we have zero, which is where we don't think that the animals have any emotion. We don't think that they maybe even feel pain right. or, you know, we've, we've gone to that extreme and that's where you get into really uh, an abuse scenario yeah. um, and, and things where, where we just really don't understand the animal at all. So yeah. I, I heard a really good clip. Uh, this came from the Warwick Schiller horse training. Oh. Um, he's, he's a great yeah, horse trainer. Following. Maybe, I don't know if you sent it to me, but yeah, excellent. Sure. Yeah, I'll have to, to send you the clip. Um, but they were talking about that word, anthropomorphizing. Um, and he said, what we forget is that we are sharing a mammalian experience. Oh, We're all mammals. Yes. Right? For the most part in this scenario. Yeah. Um, so we forget that at a, at a basic level, um, in our physicality, um, that we share these experiences. So it's all about balance. Life is all about balance. We don't want to go to the extreme of thinking, uh, I'm mommy or daddy to my pet because that can go down a, uh, a scenario where you are abusing the animal. For yeah. your own emotional And we're certainly dumbing it down in those scenarios, which is, which is a problem for me. Yeah. And then it becomes very difficult to make uh, hard decisions. Yeah. Medical care, um, things like that become very difficult. Um, or we go the opposite extreme, which is no emotion and get into an abuse scenario with that. Right. Yeah. They don't um, have so, any value. Yeah. Yeah. So while... Oh. Uh, while I don't think that we should completely anthropomorphize, I don't think that we should completely not. You have to be in the middle, the uncomfortable middle, as you like to say. It's all in the middle. That's where, yeah. it, that's where it lies. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. Um, and I'm so, going to take the training tip this week. And uh, last week, Tommy talked about uh, socializing and how people related to the canine flu were taking our animals out too soon. We don't, we don't do our diligence in our training and slowly move into that. All you hear is socialization. I even hear people with little puppies. I got to get them out. I'm like, no, you don't. Keep them in the house. Keep a leash on them. And, you know, here's You my get them out in a controlled manner. Controlled manner, absolutely. And little doses at a time. So exactly. My, my training tip this week relates to my conversation with a gal this morning who was um, offered me a cage. I'm looking for a kennel for the big dog. Uh, Because they're expensive, so I'm going to try to find one online. Um, I'm all about being thrifty. Uh, So she was, she had offered me these beautiful kennels that are way too small for the 68 pound standard poodle I just got. And I said to her, um, because I know she has uh, medium sized dogs and they're lovely, the kennels that fold up. So I said, why are you giving the kennels away? And she said, I just don't use them anymore. And she said, well, let me ask you to consider this. We live in Florida. Wouldn't matter where you are, but this is the case I make in Florida. By the way, I require my clients to kennel train their dogs. I, mm-hmm. I believe in it so much. 
And um, I said, she said, I used them when they were puppies and they did good with it. And now I'm going to get rid of them. And I said, well, they fold up flat. But I said, I would consider uh, maintaining their kennel training. And I said, as for my, my dog, uh, Trooper, he's in his kennel half of the day. You can't find him. He's hanging out. Ah, I hear Jimmy D. So this is our case of negative reinforcement. The mailman just came and delivered the mail. And Jimmy is having his barking reinforced by the mailman walking away. Well, there's no confusion that the mail is coming in your house, right? <laughs> exactly. It happens the same time every day. Oh, he knows it's happening and okay. he just heard the click of the, of the, the mailbox. All right. So, um, I said, I would keep the kennels, please consider keeping the kennels and utilizing them. And, you know, at least even if you don't have them out in the house, leave them, you know, where you can use them at least once a week or so, because here's where I come from on this. I truly believe I've seen it in action. I know this to be true. The most responsible thing and loving thing we can do for the animals in our care is train them, put a great foundation on them and even some upper level training. And if you're not capable of doing that, I implore you to find a trainer who can do that. It doesn't have to break the bank, but you don't have a crystal ball. And yes, we want forever homes for our pets, but the reality is we have no idea what the future holds. And this is the, this is what I say to clients. If I am working with you, Tommy, or know you, and you have some dogs at home, and you have to get on a plane and go help somebody with an emergency, you, you're just gone all of a sudden, um, or worse yet, you just don't come home, God willing, that doesn't happen, you, you know, you're getting on the plane, you say, Heidi, please go to the house and get my dog, I have to run off, I'm going to be gone for a few days at least, I'm going to go to your house and get your dog. If you come to my house to get Trooper, you're going to say, open the door and say, Trooper, hey, I'm here to get you. And he's going to be yeah. like, cool. And, uh, <laughs> it, you know, if, you, if you're not scary. And he's going to run and get in his cage. You can tell him to kennel up. Or if the door gets left open in the confusion, he will not run away. He'll go stand by your car and wait for the, the road trip, right? Yeah. He'll have his little bag packed. So I did that because... I want that dog to be okay no matter what happens to me or where he ends up. And I could tell you with without hesitation that the animals that are well-trained are not the ones who typically come into harm's way. And if they go into a shelter or rescue, they actually get, get uh, out of there quickly. They get adopted quickly, and people are thrilled to have them. So that is our responsibility, in my opinion, as pet owners. So that goes back to the kennel being a major part of that. In Florida, if you go to a shelter, they have to stay in a kennel. You cannot stay with them. They, you're going to take the kennel in, and they're going to have a, a schedule to run them in that. Do you really want your dog to be the one shaking in the kennel or, worse yet, barking its head off? Even yeah. you will get annoyed after about 24 hours of that. For sure. And they don't sure. run out of gas somehow. I don't know how, but dogs can bark <laughs> forever and not run out of gas. It's exactly. not like, oh, in 15 minutes he'll be tired. Doesn't work that way. No, no. So, but that's all, fi actually, it's kind of an easy fix. So just consider the kennel is really important. And we'll, we'll talk more about other training tips and a lot of this online as well. All right. Well, we've had a, a very healthy conversation today and, uh, we're going to wrap this up. And Tommy, I'm so glad to uh, be doing this podcast with you. I'm really enjoying it. I'm learning some stuff myself as well. And uh, so thank you so much for being a part of it. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you for coming up with the idea. I think it's great. Yeah, well, good. Hopefully we'll uh, catch on and people will be actually be seeing this instead of just a conversation between you and I. So yeah. <laughs> with that, I would love for you to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can catch the video portion of this online on YouTube at Heidi Harriet and also Heidi Harriet's Animal Tales on Facebook and Instagram. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week with some more doggone good information. See you next week, Heidi. Thanks.